Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. As we continue our special series called The neo View, Tom and I are going to talk to Dr. Susan Kegley about a new research initiative called The Hive Project and why this research is important to understanding what is impacting honeybee health. First, I'd like to welcome to the show my special co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. It's good to be here again. And our guest today, Dr. Susan Kegley. Hi, June. Thanks for having me. Dr. Kegley, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as well as the Pesticide Research Institute? I'm a chemist. I'm an organic chemist, and um, I started the Pesticide Research Institute in 2006 after working for a number of years teaching in uh, academia and also working for Pesticide Action Network, a nonprofit. And I started my own business because I wanted to do some real research that is, you know, difficult to do in a nonprofit setting. So my latest project is collaborations with commercial beekeepers to look at the problems affecting honeybees. And we started a hive tracking project. That's what we call it. And basically there are several factors that are being evaluated for potential harm to bees, including pesticides, mites, the varroa mite is a, is a pest of bees, habitat loss, and pathogens like viruses and bacteria and fungi that are affecting the bees. And so our goal was to look at all of these factors at once, because if you only look at one, you can't understand how they might be interacting with each other. And for example, we know that pesticides affect the immune system of bees. So if you have viruses and a transmitter of viruses like the varroa mite that bites the bees and sucks the bees' blood out and in the process transmits viruses. So if you have that scenario and you've ruined the bees' immune system by exposure to pesticides, then you have a perfect storm for devastating the honeybee colony. Dr. Kegley, mainstream media has been circulating that honeybee populations are on the rise. However, the beekeeping community knows fully well that this is a falsehood and a great exaggeration of what is truly a reality. Can you please tell us exactly what are the current statistics for global honeybee declines? So this is a very interesting point, and I see this over and over again. I'm really glad you're giving me a chance to say something about it. The number of honeybee colonies is not a good measure because a colony, remember, is a queen bee and some thousands of worker bees. That number of thousands can be a couple of thousand, or it can be a hundred thousand. So a better measure that we actually track through the USDA survey system is honey production. And honey production in 2013 was the lowest ever on record since they began keeping records in 1939. Uh, it bumped up a little in 2014, and we don't have the numbers for 2015 yet. But um, so, you know, number of colonies basically tells you that beekeepers are desperately trying to generate some new bees, but in the process, they sacrifice honey. You can either make bees or you can make honey, but you can't do both and be successful. 
Well, I'd just like to add a little personal note. You know, I've gone through this, too. I was I was reading an interview just recently about Jim Doan, and Jim was a commercial beekeeper who was hit hard by the systemic pesticides. And he said that his, his average production went from 124 pounds per colony to nine pounds per colony. And I'm going through the same thing. I'm going into the harvest right now, and I'll have about a tenth of the crop that I would have had just a few years ago. Typically, I would have produced several tons of high-quality table honey. I'll be lucky to have a few hundred pounds this year. So we're all struggling, and uh, everybody knows that you can lie with statistics, and they've been manipulated very carefully by the agri-criminal industry. Dr. Kegley, could you explain what exactly it is that you would be tracking in the hive project? So we've got 60 beehives. Three beekeepers are participating, each with 20 beehives. And we're over the course of 2014, what we did is we measured uh, pesticide residues in the hive four different times. We also measured mite loads, how many varroa mites, per 100 bees there were. We measured pathogen level, viruses and bacteria, and we evaluated each hive individually for strength, just to look and see, are there bees that look diseased, that have deformed wings? Are there problems with the queen? Are they superseding their queen and making a new one because she's not uh, functioning well? Uh, basically, just getting a good feel for, is this healthy hive or not? So you look at that over time and watch as before the bees go into almonds in California, which is where we started in January, and then after they come out, and then we look at them at the beginning of summer, at the end of summer, and um, what we found is some really interesting results. The almond pollination is an event, a beekeeping event, and most of the bees, most of the commercial bees in, in the U.S. end up in California for almond pollination. And almond growers are very careful about what they apply uh, in terms of pesticides during the pollination because they don't want to kill their bees. They need those bees. But there are some pesticides that are still problematic for bees, even though they're not, there's no warnings on the label. And these are certain fungicides that are in combination with some other chemicals are very problematic for bees and also insect growth regulators. So we started our first analysis of the beehives before they went into almonds. We found very few pesticides. And then once they came out of almonds, there were many, anywhere between 7 and 21 different chemicals in the hive, and mostly fungicides and insect growth regulators, sometimes very high concentrations. So it was really interesting to see what's happening in the almonds. And then it changes over time, but not quickly, which is another very interesting point. People who have done these kind of studies before look at one point in time, and they find a pesticide or not and draw a conclusion based on that. But what we're seeing is that the pesticides that the bees bring in on pollen or in honey, they stay in the hive for quite some time. It depends on, you know, how fast, how many bees are in there, how fast they eat it, how much pollen they brought in. But basically, the dose can be spread out over several months or even six months. So the idea that a bee would only see a small amount of a chemical is actually not true. They're being dosed over a long time period. Dr. Kegley, you recently shared some information about the difficulty in identifying neonicotinoids in dead bees after they'd been exposed. Could you expand upon that a little bit for the listeners? Yes, and my concern, I did a blog post on this at Pesticide Research Institute website, and basically um, what I kept hearing was people who had bee kills, massive bee kills with lots of dead bees in front of their hives, were being told by the regulators to take samples of the bees to send them in for analysis. And that raised red flags for me because there, there's several studies that show that the bees are either metabolizing these chemicals and, and while they're still alive, their systems are processing these chemicals and turning them into something else 
very quickly, within a few hours. And then another study suggests that these chemicals are binding irreversibly to uh, the nervous system of the bee. And so if it's bound irreversibly, you're not going to see it in an analysis. And then, you know, there's also just the process of if these bees have been laying out in the hot sun in front of the hive, dead, for several days, oxygen in the air, sunlight, uh, just the temperature will end up degrading these pesticides. So sampling bees, unless you are uh, you know that the bees have actually been sprayed or have come in contact with dust or spray on the outside of their bodies, is just not going to show you anything about what they've been exposed to. The better thing to sample is um, a matrix from inside the hive, such as pollen or uh, nectar or honey, and pollen seems to be the reservoir of many of these pesticides. So um, it's, it's really important that when there's a bee kill that you not <laughs> sample the bees only. I mean, it might be worth doing one sample, but certainly be, be sure to sample other things as well. I just want to briefly mention that this is information that's based upon the work of Dr. Hank Tenekis, his main research, which has proven that the damage by the exposure to the neonicotinoids is irreversible and irreparable. And also the dose-time ratio research, which to this day has not been negated by industry. And that's something, folks, to remember because it's two different research papers that are critical to proving the impact of neonicotinoids on honeybees. Yes, I, I'd like to go back to something that you said just a minute ago about the persistence of these neonicotinoids in the hive. If we now know that the effect on the synapses is cumulative and irreversible, this is an explanation for what many beekeepers have been describing as the failure to thrive. An acute exposure may linger for months in the hive and debilitate the bees over time. And, and this, I think, explains that phenomenon. Can you uh, make any comment on that, Dr. Kegley? I, I totally agree, Tom. I think that that is exactly what's going on. Um, what we found is that um, our, uh, our bees were being exposed over several months. And even if it's very low concentrations and it's not enough to kill a lot of bees that are, you know, you might notice a bee kill, these bees are continually being exposed and it's affecting their performance in the hive, it's affecting their foraging behavior, it's affecting the queen so she can't uh, reproduce and it's actually very devastating and certainly matches with the symptoms that the beekeepers have been seeing as failure to thrive. Dr. Kegley, can you explain what efforts have been made to raise funds for this project, and why is it difficult for scientists such as yourself to raise money for such important research, whereas there are other efforts that claim to help the bees that have brought in millions? We've uh, received a nice grant from the National Honey Board, which is a beekeeper-only association. The beekeepers are supporting this work. But the beekeepers are in trouble. So, you know, there's not a lot of loose money flying around to, to help do this kind of work. Um, the, we've also applied for uh, a number of foundation grants and also to Project APSM, and we're not funded for this. And I, in talking to my colleagues who are doing research on issues related to the decline of honeybees, what we're seeing is that they're not getting funding at the USDA, for example. People who are working on those kinds of projects at the USDA are also not getting funding through their organization. And this is somewhat consistent with the blind eye that the government is turning towards the potential problem of pesticides, not potential, the real problem of pesticides and, and honeybee colony losses. So there's no investment being made in this kind of work, and this is what it's going to take. We need to look at all of these factors together, and to not even look at one of the main factors is, you know, it's like the see no evil monkey. You, you put your hands over your eyes and say, I don't see a problem here. For scientists, 
you have to do science. And if you're going to do science, you have to look at all all of the factors that are affecting the, the outcome. And this study does that. And I think it's important that this work be funded. Do you know what's become of the millions of dollars that Congress has said they were going to invest in the investigation of these problems? I, I recall that two or three years ago there were hearings and Congress claimed that they were going to send something like $20 million to the USDA to do just what we're talking about. Do you know what's become of that? I don't, and I haven't seen, I've been you know, keeping my eyes peeled for uh, programs uh, that fund research on these kinds of issues, and there are a few programs the Coordinated Agricultural Project, which is a, a collaboration between several um, schools in the southeast and in the Midwest. The Stationary Hive Project uh, is evaluating honeybee health for hives that don't travel and don't do commercial pollination. And, and that doesn't give you a realistic picture of what's ex exactly going on. They are also not uh, handling their bees like the commercial beekeepers do in terms of treating for mites or managing their bees like the commercial beekeepers do. So you've got a project going that is very important. I, I'm not going to take away from the importance of it, but it's not real world in terms of what commercial beekeepers are actually, how they manage their bees. So if you want to find out what's going on in the commercial beekeeping world, you have to do what the commercial beekeepers are doing. So that's, that was one of the goals of our project. So I think there is some money going into that the CAP project, but I haven't seen major requests for proposals coming out of the USDA that will evaluate these problems that we're seeing with the bees related to pesticides. There's quite a bit on nutrition, and, uh, and you know, they funded USDA and the Presidential Pollinator Task Force funded a lot of development of land that you seed with bee-friendly plants. That's a, that's a good thing, but it, that money got snapped up very quickly. It's just requiring farmers to to plant some flower seeds. So that, that's the easy thing to do. But well, the more important work is not being funded. Can we, can we talk for a moment about habitat improvement? Because that's one of the motherhood approaches to solving these problems. And just within the last two or three days, the U.S. Geological Survey released the data that they've been collecting over the past three years. They've done extensive sampling of surface waters, and they have found the neonicotinoids in 53% of those samples. And people who are knowledgeable know that 95% of the use of, for example, the neonicotinoids on corn don't go into the plant, go into the soil and the groundwater where they can remain for years, and they've contaminated the water and the soil. And the concern on my part and on the part of many beekeepers is that habitat improvement is a ruse that's actually going to compound the problem because if you plant pollinator attractive plants on land that's been poisoned already, it's going to draw up that poison and just accelerate the killing. Could you comment? You're dead on, Tom. You know, the farmers will probably plant these, you know, pollinator friendly seeds in a field that may have been um, treated with neonicotinoids. They're very persistent chemicals. They last for years in the soil. They do, you know, wash out with irrigation water or rainwater, and then they're in the water supply. So it's it's kind of a formula for you plant attractive seeds and attractive plants for pollinators to lure them in and presumably give them food, but the food is poison. So I don't think that is eventually going to uh, help the situation as much as getting rid of these seed treatments which have been shown by several economic studies now to not even be helping the farmer. So I think a more concrete approach that would really stand a chance of, of improving the condition of the bees is to reduce the amount of seed, treated seed that's planted, get rid of these chemicals from the, from the treated seed. In some cases, they've actually hurt the farmers. I recall in soybeans, they uh, have killed off the predators of one of the pests, and the pests have now experienced an outbreak. And so using the neonicotinoids has actually compounded the problem for soybean growers. 
And it was really interesting. I just recently saw some statistics from the European harvest. So the Europeans uh, banned the use of, uh, or put a moratorium on the use of neonicotinoids on bee attractive crops for several years, starting in December of 2013. And they're now, you know, harvesting, and for several years they've been harvesting these crops, and they're finding that the yields are perhaps a little better than before than when they were using the, the neonics. So this tells us that it's a great marketing opportunity to sell more chemicals, to just only sell seeds that have neonicotinoids already coated on them, um, but it's not doing a good thing for the farmers, and it's really devastating our ecosystem. Dr. Kegley, how can people get involved with your research and also support your efforts? Um, well, we, uh, our collaboration is with the Pollinator Stewardship Council, which is an organization, a nonprofit created by and uh, for commercial beekeepers. And um, a donation to the Pollinator Stewardship Council would, uh, you know, de uh, dedicated to the hive tracking project would help support this work. Do you have an Indiegogo campaign or any other efforts? We did have an Indiegogo campaign, but that's closed now. Um, the a direct donation to Pollinator Stewardship Council would be the um, would be the way to go now. Dr. Kegley, thank you so much for being on the show today. Could you please share your website with our listeners? Our website is pesticideresearch.com, and the Pollinator Stewardship Council's website is pollinatorstewardship.org. Dr. Kegley, thank you so much for being on the show today. And when you are able to begin this project, it would be great to learn about what you found. So I would like to invite you to come back at a later point in time to discuss your findings. Great. Thank you so much, Jean. And I really appreciate your taking time to find out about the high tracking project. You're very welcome. Thank you, Susan. We all appreciate what you're doing. Thanks, Tom. And folks, please check out the companion article, which will be available on the OrganicView.com's website. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.